so let me just turn on our next uh, presenter, Mark uh, Shaggy Kazar. Hopefully, he'll appear on the screen. Okay. Hey, Okay, me? we can hear you, see you well. Okay, so a little quick, quick introduction. <clears throat> so our next uh, speaker is Mark Shaggy Kazar, engineering technical lead at Cisco. Uh, I think Cisco uh, doesn't need too much uh, introduction in the, the inventor of the multi-protocol router, uh, one of the largest and most important uh, companies in, 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 company in, in networking. <clears throat> a little bit about Mark. So he <clears throat> used to work for the well-known company Company, Banzai Cloud that has been acquired by Cisco not long ago as they were too good to be left alone. So now he works at Cisco. <clears throat> well, it's almost two years now. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it was uh, a while ago. Some a little, little details about Mark. So he fell in love with programming at the age of seven with some fatherly assistance. He managed to write an analog clock program in basic. Many years have passed since then, but uh, his enthusiasm for tech never changed, uh, which led Mark to open source software. He authored and maintains uh, to this day several open source libraries and applications and regularly contributes to even more of them. And according to his uh, profile currently, Mark tries to keep Kubernetes clusters alive at Cisco and tries to convince the world to stay the hell away from microservices. And besides being engineering the technical lead at Cisco, Mark is an organizer of the Hungarian Kubernetes and Cloud Native community and the Go Budapest community, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and That's his right. presentation today is about secret management in Kubernetes. This is the uh, 2022 edition of this presentation. And there will be a little demo at the end of the talk where Mark will show how Kubernetes secret management works in uh, Google Cloud environment. So welcome, Mark. Uh, Thank you. We are honor to have you thank you very much for joining us and accepting our invitation so the stage is yours uh, for the audience thank you. Great if you have to any questions here. to mark uh, regarding his presentation feel free to put it in the chat and mark will be happy to answer them during his presentation so actually yeah. actually do you mind if i address some of the questions for for laura because i think i go ahead feel free to react to her to presentation uh, no problems at all so, so i think there was a question about just quick two remarks uh uh, I think there was a question about using Docker with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you can't actually use Docker like the container runtime run time with Kubernetes anymore. So it's been deprecated a while ago. So now you can choose from container D and some other mm -hmm. container runtimes that implement the so-called container runtime interface. And the funny thing is that, that uh, Docker actually uses container D under the hood for some time now. So, yeah, so that, you can start, still. This, this was the start. Yeah. It started that Docker was a, yeah. the, the default um, solution for Kubernetes, but it changed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the Good questions. Point. And the other other question was about uh, building cross platform images. And uh, it is possible. So you can use BuildKit, which, is, uh, which was also started by the Docker community or, or Docker as the company. Um, and you can use BuildKit and QEMU to actually build cross-platform images. So that's that's already available for some time now. I'm not saying it's particularly fast, but at least it's stable. So compared to the beginning, it's it's quite stable now. And if you need to deliver um, images to multiple platforms, you can use QEMU, QEMU and, and BuildKit to build those images. Again, so for, for a project I've been working on, an open source project called DAX, when we added multi-platform images, the build suddenly, the build time suddenly jumped from like six or seven minutes to half an hour. So it's really slow and it's it's not necessarily a complicated project. It's a, it's a quite simple project, but uh, yeah, be prepared to, uh, to, to longer build times if you want to use that to build cross-platform images. Okay, we'll do. Thank you very much. So let me just uh, um, pass the screen sharing to you and I will disappear from the screen and just get back at the end of your presentation. Okay, thank you. Sure. Go ahead. So uh, again, thank you for the introduction. And uh, let me just say uh, thank you, Laura, for the excellent presentation, especially your thoughts about DevOps. I, I, I have a lot of conversations about DevOps these days and there is an overwhelming confusion about what DevOps is about. And many people think it's about uh, tools and practices, uh, whereas it's it's mostly about collaboration and, and communication between the different parties. So uh, thank you for that. So let's jump to 
another topic uh, within Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes secrets. And uh, for those who don't know me, yep. So I'm Mark Shaggy Kazar. I work currently. I work at Cisco as an engineering technical lead slash SRE, and I've been working with Kubernetes for well many years now. I can't even count them. Uh, I've been building Kubernetes distributions. I've been operating Kubernetes clusters. I've been operating applications on top of Kubernetes. I've been developing Kubernetes like plugins and integrations. So I have some some experience in the field um, to deliver this presentation today. Mm. So let's start with a common belief. Let's let's call it the common belief that uh, Kubernetes secrets are not secure. Uh, how many of you agree with that? Or how many of you heard that that uh, claim before? Let's see. Okay. <laughs> so let's let's actually try to try to answer that. I'm going to try to answer that today or explain which parts of it is true and which parts are not. But let's see what Kubernetes secrets are for uh, first. So probably the name suggests that Kubernetes secrets are for storing some sort of sensitive information required for an application to operate. And since we've learned from, from Laura's presentation, uh, containers are running pods. And we can like very easily uh, inject information into containers using Kubernetes or, or using uh, pods in Kubernetes, you can either mount secrets as files and then your application will be able to read those files from the secrets, or you can mount secret values uh, into a, a pod as an environment variable. And again, the application will, will have access to that environment variable and can use that. For example, a common example is uh, database credentials. You probably want to inject those as environment variables into an application. So how does the Kubernetes secret look like? Again, this is probably not new. You've seen a couple so-called Kubernetes objects or manifests in, in Laura's presentation. This is yet another Kubernetes object. It's an, it has an API version, a kind, some sort of metadata. Type is like a secret specific uh, field here, but it's not, uh, it's not that important for our example. And then we have a data field, which is going to store our secret values. And if you take a closer look, and I've seen that in the chat, uh, if you have a, a built-in uh, base64 parser, you're going to realize that this is base64 here. This is not an encrypted string. This is basic base64. And a lot of people like jump at this, this fact that uh, you find base64 encoding in, in Kubernetes secrets. And to me, it's 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 a bit surprising actually, but uh, this is what confuses people the, the most. And if you take a look at other like secret solutions or, or, or places where you have secret values, like if you, for example, if you use Vault and if you get a secret value from Vault, that's not going to be encrypted either. So I don't know why people get surprised that if they like, fetch the secret value from Kubernetes, they're going to get a plain text, although base64 encoded value, but it's still plain text. And this is the key here, that uh, base64 is an encoding solution. It's not for encryption. And uh, and in Hungary, a couple of years ago, Hungarian people will remember that we had uh, uh, a bit of a drama with uh, the public transport company called uh, BKK who stored passwords and and I think it was passwords in plain text and it uh, became known as BKK encryption, which is basically storing uh, passwords in plain text in a database. But this is not that. So base64 is not, not for encrypting something, it's for encoding something. And it makes a lot of sense actually to use base64 in, in, in secrets or in Kubernetes secrets because if you think about what kind of data you store in Kubernetes secrets, if, if you have experience with Kubernetes that you know that one common type of data is, for example, certificates. And certificates have, have characters like new lines. And you want to be able to store certificates as Kubernetes secrets. So you need to use, well, you don't need to, 
But early on, it was a decision to introduce Base64 as encoding to uh, make storing values like certificates and other uh, values that include special characters easier in Kubernetes secrets. So, so this is this is not the the reason why Kubernetes secrets may be problematic from a security standpoint. And to understand uh, what could be a reason why people say, or what could be the real reason to say Kubernetes secrets are not safe or, or it's not a good idea to use them, is taking a look at the different kind of data states that a, a specific secret is in when uh, we think about Kubernetes. And let's let's talk about two different data states. Let's ignore in use for now because that's that's not really relevant for this example, but there are two states that you will find data at. One is called in transit, which is when you move data from point A to point B. And Kubernetes is covered from this perspective because Kubernetes uses TLS uh, between its components for communication. So data does not travel between a component like kubelet to the between the kubelet and the API server unencrypted. It's always encrypted. So it's not a problem if the data itself is not in an encrypted form if uh, the the um, transport channel between the two is encrypted, which is, which which is so it's not a problem. The other type of state that you will uh, that or or we should take a look at is called data at rest. And uh, if you if you know how Kubernetes looks like from an architectural or infrastructure perspective, you know that there is a storage layer which is usually at CD. Etcd is a distributed cable key value store. And uh, data, data at rest is when you store something. And you want to make sure that if you store that data, that it's stored in an encrypted form. So that if you like, for example, if you steal the hard drive, you can't read the data. And generally speaking, data at rest below the etcd level is usually solved by simply encrypting the drives. The problem is that on the etcd level, there is no encryption by default. There's a so-called encry encryption at rest configuration in Kubernetes, which allows you to store secrets in an encrypted form in etcd, which means the API server would encrypt the secret itself and store the secret or store the encrypted secret in etcd, which means if, if an angry etcd operator tries to store the secrets, they still can't read it because it was encrypted by the API server itself. Uh, the problem is that this configuration uh, is disabled by default or it's configured to store everything in plain text by default, which means that the API server, we still use TLS to communicate with etcd, but the value stored in etcd will be plain text, which means if I'm an angry etcd operator at Google, for example, or at one of the large cloud provider companies who who uh, who operate Kubernetes clusters, I can steal the data from etcd and, uh, and gain access to the secret values stored within. Because by default, Kubernetes doesn't encrypt the secrets stored in etcd. And the thing is that even, even in case of managed uh, Kubernetes distributions, uh, there, this, this configuration is not enabled by default. If, there might be some places where it's enabled, but for example, at AWS, I'm sure uh, that you have to enable it manually. And I think even at GKE, you have to enable uh, envelope encryption manually. So uh, just to recap our, our original claim that Kubernetes secrets are not uh, secure, Secrets are stored in plain text by default. That's a problem. So that's something as a Kubernetes operator, you have to take care of to automatically, or, or sorry, or to configure uh, encryption using whatever solution you want to use. There are a bunch of different solutions that you can use. The problem is that in case of many services, you have no, you have no control over uh, how this thing gets configured. I mean, there is an option in most of the cases to configure it's often called envelope encryption if you take a look at the managed services, but you don't actually know that it's configured because it's it's an API server configuration and you usually don't have access to that uh, in case of managed services. So in case of a managed service, you have to have like a trust relationship with them or you have to trust them 
uh, that they manage this configuration properly. We haven't talked about this, but in order to make sure that only the uh, uh, authorized personal has access to secrets, you have to configure RBAC. If you don't configure RBAC properly, then uh, someone with no authorization might gain access to secrets from Kubernetes itself. So this is not a data at first problem, but it's a, it's a Kubernetes problem. But it's important that Base64, again, it's an encoding. It's not the problem. It's not the reason why Kubernetes secrets may be unsecure. And uh, again, there are, there are several uh, aspects to this problem. If you are the primary operator of Kubernetes, if you are the primary operator of etcd, you configure an envelope encryption and you know what you are doing, then you can say that that using Kubernetes secrets is absolutely safe because you control all the variables. If you don't, well, then maybe we can say that Kubernetes secrets really aren't fully secure. I know that there is no such thing as fully secure, but uh, less secure than ideal. All right, so this obviously begs the question that uh, whether you should use Kubernetes secrets at all and if yes, when, when should you do that? And I already gave one example. If you have full control of the stack, you, you can absolutely be sure that every configuration is set properly. You can use Kubernetes secrets. It's going to be safe. Another case is when you trust your provider completely, you have the necessary, I don't know, compliance and trust agreements uh, with your company, then you can also say, okay, if they, screw something up, then uh, I can sue them anyway. So I'm, I'm covered. Uh, another scenario when you can probably use Kubernetes secrets is when you rotate secrets frequently. Because if you rotate secrets, uh, that may be, even though a secret value may leak or may get stolen, but uh, uh, if you realize that it, it, it was in fact stolen, then you can, uh, you can rotate the secret manually uh, or if you have an automation for that, even better. So if you secret, if you rotate secrets frequently, it's fairly it's fair to say that using Kubernetes secrets is okay. And there is of course the scenario when you don't really have a choice because you don't have like an alternative solution to Kubernetes secrets, uh, and you have to use Kubernetes secrets. You can decide whether it's worth the risk or not. All right, so. Uh, let's see what other solutions can we use if we decide that Kubernetes secrets uh, are not going to work for us. And uh, this is going to be some, uh, some self-marketing here because there is a component called Bank Vaults, which is well known in the, in the industry now. Uh, we've started that at Banzai Cloud and it's basically a tool set for HashiCorp's vault. HashiCorp's vault is probably the, the, the uh, most popular secret management solution out there. I mean, non-managed secret solution, a secret management solution out there today. And Bank Vault is basically an integration layer on top of, of HashiCorp's vault for Kubernetes. So it's it's an operator. Uh, uh, so you can, you can actually run HashiCorp's vault on top of Kubernetes using Bank Vaults. And it comes with the so-called Kubernetes webhook uh, or, or mutation webhook um, that you can use to inject secrets from Vault directly to pods, completely skipping Kubernetes secrets. So all the, all the uh, Kubernetes uh, secret storing and other issues that may have with Kubernetes secrets, they are not present in this solution at all because secret values are injected directly to pods. Let's see how. So who, who heard about uh, mutating webhooks before, or they're they are also called admission, dynamic admission plugins or dynamic admission webhooks. Who, who heard about those or used or, or, or maybe a written one? Okay, one, I see one, not yet, okay. Well, uh, it, it's, it's good to know the different components of Kubernetes and dynamic admission plugins is one that you often used, not necessarily the right one, but often used for, for all the different kinds of purposes. But in our case, the mutating webhook uh, provided by Bank Holds, 
uh, basically mutates pods. Uh, remember, pods are the, uh, the, the smallest unit of uh, scaling in Kubernetes, and you can run containers within pods. So basically, the webhook itself listens to events when you create a new pod. And when you create a new pod, it checks whether there are any secrets that you would want to inject from Kubernetes. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So basically, the webhook itself checks whether you want to use a secret from Vault. We'll talk about how it detects if you want to use a secret from Vault. And if it detects that uh, you do, then it injects a uh, binary into the container itself called Vault env. It does that through, it does that through an init container in the volume mount. It's 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 not that important right now. But the, the important thing is that, that the webhook itself mutates the pods, changes it actually, and uh, injects a binary into our own container. Basically changing the entry point of the container. Uh, how does how does the, the webhook know that we want to use a secret from vault? Where well, there's a specific pattern that you need to use in environment variables or in secrets uh, or config maps or even CRDs. So anything that results in an environment variable in a pod with a specific pattern, which is vault colon path to the secret, and there are some other parameters that you can pass. So if any environment variable in the pod matches that specific pattern, then vault env is going to replace the value of that environment variable with the secret from vault and then call the, the actual application um, in the container. So this way, you can see that uh, the secret actually never leaves the container and it's it's never seen by Kubernetes. It's, it's uh, the first time you see the secret is uh, when you call this vault and binary or when, when Kubernetes runs the container and the entry point runs this vault and binary. Uh, and it uh, injects or replaces the environment variable with the actual secret value. So in theory, this uh, sounds like a great solution. Uh, you can use Vault. So if, if uh, you already use Vault at your company, then you can continue using Vault as a secret management solution, and you can just inject secrets from Vault to containers directly. Kubernetes uh, is, is out of the picture. But obviously, it it, uh, it comes with some caveat. So, uh, if the web, webhook itself is unavailable for some reason, then uh, based on the configuration, you won't be able to launch new pods. So, you can configure the webhook to reject launching new pods, which means that if you have to deploy something new or scale your application up, it's going to fail. It's not going to work. Uh, the other option is that you ignore the failure, which means your application will start. Uh, without injecting this binary into the container, and your application will basically fail because uh, it, it it won't have the necessary secrets. It won't be able to talk to databases, etc. So, so if the webhook is unavailable for some reason, then you can't launch new applications. Already running applications are fine, but that's that's a snowflake. So that's in Kubernetes, you 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 should always expect that. A node goes away and Kubernetes has to reschedule pods, or uh, I don't know, for some reason, just Kubernetes decides to schedule a pod to another one, whatever. So in Kubernetes, you should always expect that scheduling events will occur, which means that if the webhook is unavailable, you are in the problem. Obviously, there are solutions to ensure that the webhook is highly available. Um, but still, yeah, there is a risk, and you should be aware, you should be aware of that. The other risk, obviously. Uh, resulting in, in basically the same behavior is that if Vault is unavailable, unavailable, then you, then the Vault and won't be able to fetch the secret values, and again your application will will run without secrets, and it won't be able to talk to databases, for example. Obviously, you can you can always implement fail safes in your application that it doesn't actually fail, that the container doesn't actually fail or exit. You can just say your application is unavailable at the moment, but that's still going to be a bad experience for your users. Or the other one, and, and I've seen this repeatedly, uh, not just with bank calls, but with Kubernetes webhooks all the time, 
that if the webhook is misconfigured, Kubernetes may mutate every pod, including pods in the cube system or other namespaces that are basically responsible for running Kubernetes and running your network in Kubernetes. And if you mut mutate those pods and those pods fail for some reason as a result of the mutation, you can basically render the cluster dead. And uh, I've done that a couple of times, uh, sometimes on purpose, just to see uh, if I can manage to do that, sometimes um, uh, by accident. And I've seen that a lot of people I've seen a lot of people doing that by accident, simply because they haven't configured the webhooks properly. So there are risks involved with a solution like this, but this is still like the most secure solution outside of Kubernetes secrets. So what if you don't use Vault? What if you use uh, solely a cloud provider provided services? There is an alternative solution to bank holds, which is called Cube Secrets Init. It's basically the same as bank vaults, except it works with AWS, GCP, and other cloud provider um, operated secret stores. Obviously, that also means that it comes with the same caveats as bank vaults. So if you want to use this um, instead of bank vaults, uh, you can, and it can still uh, be operated properly. So you can still make sure that the webhook is highly available uh, the cloud provider will probably be highly available, so you won't have to worry about that. But you still have to configure the webhook properly to make sure that it doesn't mutate pods that it shouldn't be. Uh, so Cube Secrets in it, if you use GCP as a um, secret manager, can be a good solution if you don't want to store uh, secrets, for example, in your, in your GitOps repository. So if you do GitOps, you use tools like Argo CD, uh, or you don't use tools like Argo CD, but you still do GitOps and uh, deploy everything from a GitOps repository, there is always the question, how do you manage secrets? Do you store the secrets in the repository and, and use Kubernetes secrets? What do you do? And with this solution, you can basically uh, securely uh, use secrets from a secure store like GCP's secret manager in Kubernetes without committing secret values in the repository, which is which is always a good idea to a good thing to avoid. Like you don't want to commit secrets in the repository, or, or I don't know, maybe you do. Uh, it's up to you. But again, it has some risks, and uh, and and we talked about situations where using Kubernetes secrets might uh, make sense and might uh, be absolutely okay. Uh, and uh, the thing I just mentioned is that. If you want to use Kubernetes secrets, or if you have to use Kubernetes secrets, how do you store them? And uh, obviously, if you use Vault, then you store your secrets in Vault and you synchronize secrets to Kubernetes secrets somehow. But it would be nice if there was a component that, that took care of this automatically without having to like running scripts manually or, or worrying about it at all. Fortunately, there is, and it's called external secrets. So if we, we we are so it's important, we are now back on the track of using Kubernetes secrets, but with an external secret store. So so far we talked about not using Kubernetes secrets at all, uh, and that was combined with a secret store outside of Kubernetes. We still want to use a secret store, but let's entertain the idea that we that we use Kubernetes secrets, and you can do that with external secrets, which is uh, basically an operator. Uh, that comes with custom resources and you can define the structure of your Kubernetes secrets in these external secrets and the, you can define how you want to fetch them from external stores. So for example, uh, you can use templating, for example, if you want to create a specific file in a Kubernetes secret, or you can just map simple keys from the secret store into Kubernetes secrets. We are, we are actually going to take a look at this shortly including uh, a demo of uh, Cube Secrets in it. So, all right, so we have like alternatives to Kubernetes secrets. We have nice secret management solutions. Uh, and, and the next question that often comes up is, okay, I have all these automations in place. How do we notify the workload if a secret changes? And the thing is, there aren't many solutions in the ecosystem right now. In fact, uh, this has been an open question for quite some time now. And uh, there is one. So there is one solution uh, that's uh, gaining more and more traction. It's called Reloader. 
And it works quite well with external secrets. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work with bank vaults and queue secrets in it since it can't detect Kubernetes secret changes, which is what Reloader does. So Reloader detects a change in a Kubernetes secret and triggers a standard uh, rollout of a deployment or a stateful set by simply changing an annotation. Or you can configure how it, throw, it triggers the rollout, but the default behavior is that you change an annotation on the workload itself and that will trigger uh, a standard rollout. And if you think about it, kubectr rollout does the same thing. So if you want to manually, I mean, I hope you don't trigger new rollouts by deleting pods. I hope you don't. Uh, and, the, and I hope you use kubectl uh, rollout to trigger a new rollout, or if you need to restart pods, or restart pods, technically you can't restart pods, you can only delete them and, and let uh, Kubernetes start new ones. I hope you don't do that. I hope you use the rollout command. But the rollout command does basically the same thing. So it changes an annotation on the deployment uh, object, and that will trigger uh, a standard rollout. Reloader does the same thing. And it works quite well with external secrets since external secrets creates Kubernetes secrets. So when a th secret changes in Vault or, or GCP secret manager and external secret detects that external secrets actually doesn't detect changes, but it checks new values every 10 minutes by default. And obviously you can change that. So if you want to uh, change that period to one minute or one hour, you can do that. So if an external secrets detects changes, it updates the secret. Reloader detects changes in the secret and triggers a rollout in the, in the deployment. And that's, that's the full circle. So that's how you manage secrets and uh, and uh, restart workloads these days. So let's do a demo. And uh, I don't have Reloader prepared here, but I do have a cube secret secret and external secrets. And I actually have the whole thing in a repository. Um, let's see if I can switch to that. I haven't pushed it yet. Uh, is the uh, font size OK? Or should I zoom in a bit more? And uh, so. Are there any questions so far that I can answer? Obviously, I can answer them at the end as well. But uh, OK, let's uh, zoom in a bit more. OK. So question regarding Reloader, is it completely usable for the end user who uses the service that is provided by Kubernetes? Is there any interruption in the service? Again, so Reloader triggers a standard uh, a rollout. So if you have your pod disruption budget configured properly, and if you have your other reload uh, or rollout settings configured properly, then the, the end user shouldn't experience any interruption in the service. So it's it's like a standard deployment. If your standard deployment inter causes interruptions, then you have something uh, not configured properly in, in the, again, in the rollout settings or in your pod disruption budget. Um, other than that, you shouldn't experience anything. Again, if you have like a misconfigured webhook, that uh, doesn't allow scheduling new pods, then you are in a trouble. But uh, you are in trouble anyway, because Kubernetes will just reschedule pods on its own. So um, there's no difference. All right, so I will have this repository pushed uh, to this URL. I will share this with the organizers, and they can, they can send it out. Haven't pushed this yet, so don't look for this. Uh, but it basically explains everything you need to go through the demo, including setting up the Kubernetes cluster, setting up the in, enabling the services, creating a new cluster, uh, and install, installing the necessary components. I already installed these, so I've already everything installed, and I will just show you the configuration and how it works. So, uh, so these are already installed. But if you want to try it yourself, don't bother doing it right now. I'll push this after the presentation and you can do it yourself if you want to. All right, so let's see what we have here. We have two demos and I will start with a few secrets in it. And uh, so as we talked about cube secrets in it, we basically want to inject secrets into env environment variables. So, uh, and, and again, so this is, this works with secrets, this works with config maps and every kind of CRD uh, that results in an environment variable being injected into a pod. The operator is clever enough to detect all those and it will inject the necessary binary into the container, which will resolve the environment, which will resolve the secret and replace 
the environment variable value with the right secret value. But let's 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 start with these. So let's start with the simple environment variable without the secret, and let's see if this works. So uh, let's see if I can deploy this. I'm using customize and kubectl to deploy all this. Uh, again, everything will be in the instructions. Uh, let's hope it works. All right, so it's it should be deployed. Let's see if I can. Uh, Uh, demo cube secrets in it. Let's see if it runs. Hello. No, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Okay. So let's see if, yeah, the pod is running. Uh, and let's see if we can uh, port forward into that. So port forward. I'm not going to bother using services or ingresses, uh, as you saw in, in Laura's presentation. I'm just going to port forward directly into the pod, uh, deploy demo, and I think the port was 8080. Yeah, so I'm forwarding into the pod. And now if I If I look into that, you can see that I'm getting this, this not secret at all value that I've, I've defined here. Okay, now let's change that and let's replace it. Uh, let's add some new value line so you can you can you can read it. So let's replace that with this special special format um, that I've talked about. Again, this is this is for GCP and AWS. This is this is done by Cube Secrets in it. Backports obviously uh, uses something like what, but for Cube Secrets in it, you can you can use this format GCP Secret Manager, and basically this is the path to the secret I have. So if I try to Glee Cloud Secret something, uh, yeah, this one. So I create. I've already created this so-called my secret. So if I try to get the value, I should be able to do that. Yeah, so I have I have my super secret data in the secret already. So let's see if I uh, save this and deploy. Yeah, this is the one. Okay, you can see the deployment is configured. So something has changed. Now let's see. Uh, let's restart the port forward, and let's see if I can. Oops, there is my super secret data. So as you can see in this case, uh, the actual environment variable when the pod started was this special thing, special string uh, that pointed to the secret uh, in in uh, in GCP, and uh, we can quickly look into the pod. So demo cube secrets get pod. So you can see. Uh, well, maybe not see very well because it's not. Uh... But you can see here that there is an init container injected called secrets in it. And uh, let me find the container as well. Yeah, the container is here. So you can see that demo is my application. That's just a simple Go app I wrote it in a couple of minutes. And you see that the entry point has been changed to secrets in it. And there are some arguments uh, prepended to the to the actual command, and then it runs my own demo binary. So this is how uh, it. And again, the the secret in in the pod itself. So for Kubernetes, this is just a, a simple string. It, it's it's not the secret itself, and we can actually uh, test this as well. So let's see. Uh, I can. I think I can exit into the pod here. Hopefully. Yeah, I want a demo container. What? Oh, I'm missing the. Okay. 
So if I run env here and maybe uh, yeah, you can see that by default, this is still the old uh, environment variable. If I prepare, what was it? Secrets init provider Google. Where is it? Uh, Let's see, where, where does it mount? Helper, okay. Nope. Okay. Hello, <laughs> something went wrong. Now you can see that if I prepare these secrets in binary before and I have my secret data there. So that's how that's how cube secret secrets work. Again, this is the same as, as bank vaults if you use vault, but basically uh, the secrets in binary right here talks to GCP secret manager, fetches the secret value and replaces the value of the environment variable. Okay, so that that was the cube secrets in the demo, and let's let's quickly go through the external secrets one as well. Uh, hopefully, I'm I'm still in time. Uh, but it's it's going to be a bit more complicated. So let's take a brief look at it as well. So in in, in this case, I'm going to use an actual Kubernetes secret. So before, just just for the sake of the demo, I didn't use a Kubernetes secret. I just used straight away environment variables in the deployment, but I could have used secrets like this, like this one here with cube secrets in it as well. And it would have worked the same way. The secret value would have been that special string and the the, the environment variable would have been the same special string and, and the cube secrets in it would have replaced that with the real secret value. So let's say how that works with, uh, with external secrets. Uh, and again, in this case, I'm going to use an actual secret, uh, not a uh, not a, a plain environment variable that we will start with the same example. So I will have this uh, the same example uh, running without without secret for now, just to prove it works. Uh, let's see. You want to use the other demo, which is external secrets. Yeah. Okay, things are configured. Let's see if uh, if we can access this demo as well. Sorry. Hopefully, yeah, seems to be working. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So this is now, so this is a different container now. I've been talking to the one in uh, the uh, demo cube secrets in it namespace a minute ago. Now I'm using the demo external secrets one, which is basically the same at the moment, but the changes I'm going to make now in this different setup will affect this one, not the previous one. So, so let's see how this works. I talked about external secrets before, and I already told you that there is a special so-called custom resource uh, that we can use to configure uh, how the Kubernetes secret is going to be created. And this is the so-called external secret custom resource. And in this case, uh, I'm using um, a secret store called Google. I've already created this. Uh, let's see if I can quickly open that up as well. So there is a cluster secret store that I've already created. Uh, it's a cluster level. It's a cluster scoped uh, resource. It's not a namespace namespace scoped one. So you can use this cluster store in all of the namespaces. Obviously, in production, you might want you might not want to do that. But for for our purposes, this is going to be fine. And it has to be configured uh, with the project ID. Notice that I don't configure any kind of authentication here. And the reason for that is I'm using Google's so-called workload identity here which means that the um, that external secrets, when I installed it, I created a special service account 
and I configured that service account to use an IAM service account within GCP, which means that I don't have to use like a service account credentials here. I don't have to create uh, separate service account credentials and inject those as Kubernetes secrets into external secrets itself, but external secrets using its uh, uh, its own Kubernetes service account. So within Kubernetes, there is a concept of service accounts that you can use for authentication against various APIs like the Kubernetes API. But in this case, I can use the same service account to authenticate against the Google API as well and fetch secrets from the Google API uh, using that service account. Again, if you go through the example, there are the exact steps and there are documentation links in there as well. So if you're interested in the details, how virtual identities uh, work, you can go through the demo or just take a look at the links in the in the in the references and, and you can read about virtual identities. But for now, for our purposes, it's enough to know that we use virtual identities so we don't have to configure any kind of authentication here. We just need the project ID that we are going to use. This is already applied, so we don't have to worry about this, but we have to tell the external secret resource that we are using this cluster store so we can so it can fetch secrets from the right place. We are going to create a new secret called my secret. We're going to take a look at that just in a minute. And the data section here tells external secrets how to create uh, that my secret. So in our case, we are going to create a, co a new secret called my secret. We are going to read for from a secret my secret, and we are going to save it under a secret key called my secret. So my secret everywhere. Uh, but but I, I'll just show you which my secret is which in a minute. So this is this is this is the custom resource that we use to configure how secrets will get from GCP Secret Manager to um, to Kubernetes secrets. And this this resource is absolutely safe to save in save in your in your GitOps repository or whatever solution you use to deploy your applications because it doesn't actually contain any secrets. It just contains the information how external secrets can grab the secrets from your own secret store. Uh, all right, so let's go back to the deployment here. And I think, uh, I believe I've already, yeah, I've already deployed this and I've already yeah, uh, showed you that this is working fine. Now let's, let's uh, make this change here. And let's, let's replace our not secret value with a secret one. Uh, again, we are going to use an environment variable here, and the variable, the environment variable will be loaded from, so it's going to be a value from a secret, and the secret's name is going to be my secret, and the key under that secret is going to be my secret as well. Uh, so let's let's save and deploy that. Okay, it's uh, it's there now. Before before we uh, actually see that it works, let's take a look at the secret that was created by external secrets. So I'm going to list the secrets now, and you can see that there is a, a secret called my secret here. Now I can delete this. So if if I delete this one, delete secret my secret. It's deleted, but you can see that it's it's two seconds old. So the external secrets operator immediately recreated it. So if so for some reason you delete it or you want to refresh it, you can easily delete it and the external super, external secrets operator will take care of create, recreating it. Now let's see what's in that secret. So again, the secret's name is my secret. And within that secret, we are going to see so here is our data section, as we talked about this before. There, there, there is our my secret key. I could change this to something else. Again, I realize now that this is a bit confusing, probably for you, but it's important to understand that the secret itself is called my secret, and under that, there is a secret key called my secret. They are called the same, but they are different. Okay. And this is this is probably better. You, you can probably better understand now that the secret name itself is my secret, and we are looking for a key called my secret under that, and it's going to end up uh, in the my secret environment variable. So let's let's restart this this port forward. 
because the pod probably restarted as well. And let's uh, let's take a look at what the value is. Okay, so my, so so my super secret data is there again. So right now we use Kubernetes secret to inject the secret data into uh, into the pod by configuring configuring the the deployment to get the secret value from the from uh, the Kubernetes secret. Again, I haven't created any Kubernetes secret here. I don't have any Kubernetes secret in this uh, in this in this repository. If you want to take a look at the customization file, you can see that the only resources I create here is the namespace, the deployment, and the external secret. Um, itself, which we which we took took a look at here, and this is uh, yeah, this is this is the configuration for creating that secret, and it's all done by the external secrets operator. Okay, uh, so this was the demo. Uh, I hope you liked it. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask or ask at the end. Uh, either way, but. We are not, the presentation is not over yet because there, there are a couple of things that we have to discuss after, now that you've learned how to, how to manage secrets in Kubernetes and how to make it more secure or even perfectly secure if you wish. There are a couple of things within the Kubernetes world or with any, anywhere containers involved basically that uh, worth mention, that's worth mentioning. For example, if you have root access to the Kubernetes nodes, again, Laura did a great job explaining the basics of Kubernetes, so I don't have to here. But if you have access to the nodes, if you have root access to the nodes, you can still access these secrets. So if you manage to, for example, through a privilege escalation, uh, get out of a container and get into a node, you can, have all the access, you, you, you can access all the secrets uh, used on that node. Or if you are uh, if you are an operator and you've just been fired, but you still have your root access to the Kubernetes nodes, you can still go in and grab those secrets and, uh, and uh, do whatever you want. You'll probably face a lawsuit uh, as it happened in the past a couple of times already, but you can, you, can, you can cause damage if you really want to, if you have root access to the nodes. Then, as you've seen, I've I've uh, I've also did this here. So I've also uh, entered the pods itself using the exec command, and I've used the secrets in it uh, command to to get the actual secrets from from uh, from Vault. If you have exec permissions on the cluster, you can do this as well. So you can go into the you you can go into the pod, uh, and you can list all the secrets, all the environment variables. You can read all the files uh, in the in the containers file system uh, and you can you can gain access to the secrets so it's it's the same thing if you want to steal anything or you want to steal secret we, we've gone th through uh, great length to make the secret management secure make sure that it's stored secretly and uh, and it's uh, transported or, or or copied to the kubernetes cluster secretly or, or uh, safely but with a simple exec, you can still steal it and, and do whatever you want. And there is, of course, uh, the, the most common uh, source of secret leaks, uh, application logs. Uh, application logs that, uh, without thinking, log all of the environment variables or, or print all environment variables on an error page are the most common source of leaking secrets, database credentials, whatever, um, to the world, not just to to uh, to to developers and to to uh, unauthorized parties, even within the company, but to the world as well. So you have to consider all these, even though you made the whole secret management pipeline secure. It worth it's worth nothing if you don't rotate your secrets frequently. So this is this is the uh, kind of uh, I don't know greatest takeaway of this presentation: have secure secret management pipelines, but also rotate your secrets frequently. Otherwise, uh, people can can people still find a way to steal your secrets and do nasty things with them. Uh, so please rotate your secrets as well. 
thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, honestly, I was hoping for a bit more during the presentation, but uh, let's hope there will be a couple of questions. Uh, now. And yeah, there are no stupid questions. I know this is a complicated subject, so uh, feel free to ask your question, even though if you think it's stupid, it's, it's believe me, it's not. Uh, just selected the right camera. So let's check the questions if there's any in the chat. Uh, I have a couple of them here noted, so let me just start. So All right. uh, you were talking about vulnerabilities in, in Kubernetes where secrets are not stored in a secure way, if I understood it right. So isn't it something well, that it's is, not it's not really not a vulnerability, vulnerability, but, but, but it's uh, uh, not secure the storage of secrets, let's put it this way. So isn't it something yeah. that, that uh, should be addressed by the major cloud providers or 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 who's job would it be to address this or or is this something that is just good as is and you should take care of it so that's that's a great question and this is again this is this is what most people don't understand and confuse with base64 so the thing is the option to store secrets safely is there it's just not enabled by default and before it and and the, and the reason why in kubernetes by default it's plain text, it's set to plain text is because Kubernetes itself don't know where you run Kubernetes. So, and the encryption config depends entirely on the environment that you run Kubernetes in. So if you run on-prem, you would have your own KMS service running somewhere that you have to integrate into Kubernetes. If you run on GCP or AWS or, or, or Azure or, or any other cloud provider, they will have their own KMS solution that you have to configure. So, and Kubernetes, doesn't know that doesn't can't figure that out on its own so you have to actively configure it and that's that's why it's set to plain text by default now if if the question is why cloud providers don't enable this by default that's an absolutely <laughs> very good question, good question because right? it's, it's a valid question because if you think about other resources like storage buckets for example you can get storage buckets encrypted without specifying a kms key why can't you do the same with, with a Kubernetes cluster? Good question. <laughs> you can't just say it's okay, let's just encrypt everything. You, you actively have to configure it. So it's, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, the answer is, I don't know, it's beyond me. It should be enabled by default, uh, but it's not. <laughs> so again, this might, again, on GCP or on GK, it might be enabled now by default. I, I don't know. I know that a couple of years ago it wasn't. And I know that on AWS, it's still not. So. Mm -hmm. um, the, the reason is beyond me. <laughs> I mean, okay. it just doesn't make any sense not enable it. <laughs> okay, so would you recommend storing secrets inside or outside Kubernetes in an external store? And why would you store here or there? So I absolutely think that not using Kubernetes as a primary secret store makes sense. So even, even if you want to use Kubernetes secrets, uh, you should you should still use a secret store even so if you are on a cloud provider like like Google you can use the GCP secret manager and you can store secrets there and the reason for that is is simply because you might want to change how your secrets are deployed or you might want to deploy different applications with the same secrets and it's easier to manage a purpose easier to manage secrets in a purpose built tool in a secret management solution than in Kubernetes secrets. Kubernetes secrets are just the, the deployment tools. They, they are, they're not suitable for storing secrets for, for a long time. Uh, now, whether you want to use uh, something like Vault and, and skip Kubernetes secrets entirely, or you want to use something like external secrets and synchronize secrets into Kubernetes, that's a different question. It depends on your, your what, what in what environment you run. If, you, if you're running uh, in, in a, in a cloud provider environment, and you don't have envelope encryption in, uh, enabled by default, then absolutely go with Vault or go with Cube Secrets in it, because uh, that way your secrets will always be stored safely, and and you won't have any unencrypted uh, secret lying around in, in etcd, for example. But the thing is, if you have en envelope encryption enabled, or you control the whole stack, then using Kubernetes secrets is absolutely okay, because Secrets will still be stored safe, 
and a Kubernetes secrets won't be like the primary secret store you use. You can always just use external secrets and synchronize secrets there, and that's that's absolutely fine. I've 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 used both, and I've I've uh, maintained applications and clusters that that use the either Vault or GCP secret manager and the webhook. So even though I I, I mentioned that there are risks involved, if you run those properly, then then it's okay. It's it's uh, not going to cause any trouble. So from from a from an availability or or reliability perspective, uh, they uh, they are the same. Okay. Uh, the next question is related uh, to to the previous one. So as far as I understood it right, the this reloader solution is 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 mostly for um, storing secrets uh, uh, in an external store. But how do you rotate secrets if you need to rotate them frequently if they are stored in Kubernetes secrets? So is does it work with reloader or any other solution is needed? So reloader itself doesn't store any secrets. Reloader just Reload, uh, but uh, if I understood it right, it's 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 mostly for external stores, right? Or or so reloader can so reloader itself works with Kubernetes secrets or config map. So it's going to work oh, okay. if you use some sort of synchronization or just use Kubernetes secrets directly. It doesn't really matter for reloader. Uh, obviously, it would make sense to use some sort of synchronization so that you can automate secret changes. Um, uh, can can you repeat the last part of the question because I'm not sure I'm answering the right one. Um, so the question was about if if you store the secret inside of Kubernetes, how do you rotate the secrets the right way? Okay, so uh, okay, so um, rotating the secrets itself uh, without the reloader part. Reloader is for restarting the work workload. So reloader is uh, is in the picture when you actually change something or or rotate a secret, but it, it's not affected by the, the secret change mechanism. So if it either if it's an automatic rotation, if you do that manually, reloader kicks in if you change something and reloader will restart the workload. Now the secret rotation itself, again, as I as I mentioned before, don't don't use Kubernetes as a primary secret store. Use an external secret store, store your secrets either in Vault or Vault is actually great. So uh, I'd say it's the best secret management solution out there. But if you don't have a managed Vault instance, or you can't pay for HashiCorp to run one for you, or you just don't want to because it doesn't make sense for your project, you can still use a cloud provider to manage one, like GCP's secret manager. And I haven't really showed the UI here, but, uh, but uh, it does the job. So you can use GCP secret manager, and then you can use something like external secrets to automate uh, the synchronization. Uh, as I mentioned, you can have like a, a synchronization period configured. So external secrets doesn't actually see if you change the secret in in uh, in, uh, in GCP secret manager, but it just, it, it basically pulls the secret manager, and if it say see it changed, uh, it will it will change the secret as well. And when you when you change the so when it changes the secret reloader kicks in and and uh, restarts the workload. Okay, thank you. I hope that that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. So the next question is that which secret management uh, solution would you recommend to quickly get started, and which do you consider better as a long term solution? Um. Well, if you quickly have, need, need to get started, then a cloud provider solution is great. I mean, uh, it's probably limited compared to something like Vault, but uh, it's it's a great start. You can you can very easily get started uh, and uh, and just use it again. Um, if if someone so if you go through the demo that I will be uploading after the presentation, you will see that creating the secret itself is a single command. So Getting started with it is is pretty simple. Uh, in the long term, I'd say, depending on how many features you need, like Vault, Vault is not just a secret manager. It just it doesn't just store like static credentials, but it can also, for example, issue credentials for a database for you if you want to uh, use that feature, and it can automatically rotate those. So, for example, you don't have to rotate database credentials. Vault can take care of that. So if you want to use those features, I'd say consider using Vault and uh, 
either use something like backwards to run it on Kubernetes if if uh, if you want to run it on Kubernetes, or just use the HashiCorp managed solution. Uh, the HashiCorp managed services can actually run Vault on on your chosen cloud provider. So if you are on Google, then they can they can run it for you in Google, and and you can use Vault. It's also great because if you use Vault, it's it's a more let's say generic solution, uh, and you don't have to hardwire the cloud provider provided solution into your into your pipelines. But external secrets, both external secrets, bank quotes and, and cube secrets in it can work with different solutions. So it's it's not a great problem. Okay, and the last question is that you have mentioned that there is a way to get out of the Kubernetes pod and access the node and the secrets. Uh, is this possible? And is there any way to prevent this? And uh, so <laughs> is this possible in a, in a hosted uh, Kubernetes environment at a large provider? So can you access the node at a, like Google Cloud or, or Amazon Cloud? So the way this is usually happening is called uh, privilege escalation, uh, and that's that's always that's always a vulnerability in the container runtime itself. So this this is not possible by normal means. This is only possible by exploiting the vulnerability. And the thing is, privilege ex privilege escalation vulnerabilities has been the most common vulnerabilities in these container um, runtime solutions. So if you find one and this, if it's a new one and it's unpatched. Uh, then you can absolutely get out of the the pod, the container, and you can get access, often root access to the nodes because people don't really care about uh, not using root in the containers and stuff like that. So uh, it's only possible via exploiting vulnerabilities, and the solution is always patching your your your, always updating your cluster, keeping your cluster up to date, because that way, when there is an update you can always uh, make sure that all the latest vulnerabilities have been fixed there and you can install these updates to to make your cluster secure. Is Again, this, this is... Is this something that is addressed by the, the major cloud providers? So, for example, if there is a new uh, um, vulnerability comes up and could be exploited, then they just patch the Kubernetes cluster and, you know, move to the next version that other... Uh, Often it is. I mean, Google Google is absolutely, uh, or GKE is absolutely uh, the best uh, distribution out there from this perspective. Google has been always ten steps ahead of the competition because they started like they are the de facto uh, developers of Kubernetes. They started the first managed Kubernetes service, and they are always uh, way too many steps ahead. Uh, the 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 uh, the contributors so or or sorry the um, the other cloud providers so so uh, Google definitely does a great job there. Uh, lately, AWS started to started to uh, keep up, let's just say, but they are still behind. Uh, from an upgrade perspective, uh, I think I think you can automate upgrades now to to patches. I think there is an option for that on AWS. Uh, Azure, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, last time I used Azure, Azure, it's still it was. Let's say it was still in bad shape, and uh, no one really liked it. But uh, if it all goes well, then it is addressed by the provider. Then <laughs> hopefully, it is. It should be. Okay, thank you very much. I think you answered all the questions. Let's see if there is anything else so, in the chat. Uh, should you have any questions, guys, this is the right time to ask Mark. Otherwise, you will need to reach out to him after the meeting, uh, the meetup. I don't see any more so I, can, I can see another question. Yeah. Uh, I've seen occasionally other types of secrets and opaque. Ah, any insights to those? So the secret type is usually um, the secret type itself uh, is there to help validate secrets. So you can you so there are common types like like TLS if you, for example uh, I don't actually know if Kubernetes validates those but you can create your own secret type and create a, a webhook that validates those secret types so the type is basically to differentiate between secrets for different purposes and uh, and you can create custom validation uh, webhooks 
for those different secret types. So you can you can see, for example, if you work with hardware, uh, hardware's operator, they have custom secret types for database credentials, maybe even the, the Redis credentials, I'm not sure. But basically the purpose of those custom types is, um, is um, so you can write your own validation solutions. Um, other than that, they are not really useful for anything. There is some more, as I see. What do you think about the path permission? Path permission? What's that? Can, can, you, can you clarify what you mean by that? What path? Which path? Jimmy, if you could elaborate. Let's give him a minute, and if there is no explanation comes, then. <laughs> OK. So while, while, he, while he tries to elaborate, uh, uh, if you, again, I'll upload the demo and the presentation after. I mean, I probably I will just probably send the presentation to you, Jigbon, then the links okay. to the demo, and then you can distribute. But you can see some of my, my uh, you can see my email address, my website here. So if you have any more questions, uh, or you just, uh, or you think um, the question doesn't fit the format of a meetup like this, feel free to reach out. You can find me on a number of Slack channels as well. So you can find me on the Kubernetes or CNC of Slack channels. Feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk about. We got anything. the explanation, by the way. So a password, okay, a secret, cool. would be located and uh, with a specific permission for access the file. Oh, I guess. I guess you mean within a container? The path where the secret could be located in the specific permission for access to the file. So if you have a, a custom user created within a container image and you have the, the access properly set for files within the container, then even, the, even then, so even then if you, if you can exec into the pod, you will have access to that user that that you use for running the container, so you will still have access to the file itself. I don't think you can use file permissions effect effectively to make sure that only your application or only your pro process have access uh, or has access to, to that file. I mean, it it could be possible. I know that you can you can set permissions for files that you mount into containers. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think you can effectively use that to make sure that only your process has access to that file. Uh, if, uh, or at least I don't, I, I don't think you can do that. Uh, it probably makes more sense to make sure that your RBAC is configured properly within the cluster. For example, make sure that people can't access secrets directly. You, you in an ideal solution, you use external secrets, for example. So you don't actually need users to access or, or even read those secrets because they are managed by external secrets. Maybe for debugging reasons, but uh, that's a very special scenario. So ideally, your users should not have access to secrets at all, I mean secret objects, and they should be able, shouldn't be able to exec into pods either. I mean, that's a great tool for debugging, but in most of the cases, you don't need that, and users shouldn't be able to exec into pods directly. Uh, to to get get secrets. So if you have Airbus configured properly, which I realize is not always easy because because people feel feel limited if they can't exec into a pod, for example, which is a again a common tool for debugging, but it's 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 almost exclusively needed in 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 edge case scenarios. So if you have Airbus configured properly, then then you don't need to worry about things like. Uh, file access permissions within the container. I, I hope that was the question. I I hope that answers answers it. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Hopefully, it answers your question. Yeah, seems yeah. to be seems to be the right answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any more questions, uh, so I think we can wrap up. Thank you very much for your uh, time for your pre presentation. Thank you all Thank for, you for joining me. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you for the speakers, Laura and Mark, for the super interesting presentations. Thank you for Deutsche Telekom IT Solutions Hungary for supporting the event. Have a great day. Goodbye.